Hey guys, Charles Emiano here from the Bruce Lee Collection, and today I'm here with Sifu Anthony Colon. Thank you for inviting me to your school here. You're welcome. And today we're going to find out how Anthony was inspired by Bruce Lee, how Bruce Lee played a role in his life to uh, make him who he is today. So we're going to find out all about Anthony Colon here at his school in Elmhurst, Queens. So Anthony, let's uh, focus on you today. So tell me, how were you first introduced to Bruce Lee and how has he inspired you? Well, my first introduction was in the early 70s. So my earliest recollection, I was about four years old. And um, I remember watching The Green Hornet. Oh, you do? Okay. So it all started from The Green Hornet. The Green Hornet. Because I used to watch Batman and Robin, <laughs> and then they would show The Green Hornet as part of the whole, uh, you know, the whole setup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, what did you like better, Batman and Robin or The Green Hornet? Bruce Lee. You Bruce did? Bruce Lee Cato, yeah. Automatically. Because of the kicks. Yeah. So you, you, what captivated you about The Green Hornet uh, when you first saw it? Was it Bruce Lee? Was it Van Williams? Was it his martial arts? What, um, what I really enjoyed was the aura. Okay. More, more than anything because of the uh, mystique. Yeah. So I was watching uh, The Green Hornet at that time, but I was also watching Kung Fu, the TV series. Ah, okay. With the old man, Master Paul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I love that series. Right, so that whole mystique, there was a, a, a real strong mystique about the martial arts back then, but Bruce Lee, with the kicks was phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, so that's, uh, that was your first introduction to Bruce Lee. Yes. Yeah, so how did he play then a role in your life uh, early on? Like, uh, how did he influence you early on? Well, the earliest thing for most kids back then is that we wanted to kick each other in the head. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. We, we were about, the 70s. I'm being honest, yeah. Okay. It, was a, it wasn't about philosophy, yeah. or meditation. It was about, I want to kick that kid in the head. Whoa! Yeah, kind of thing. Nope. That was it. We wanted to do flying kicks on each other. I got you. I got you. That was and, and then when did you see his first movie in the big screen? What year was that that you saw? And what was the first movie you saw of Bruce Lee? Um, before I watched the Bruce Lee movies, we watched a lot of Kung Fu movies because my, fa my family, my parents were fanatics. They oh, okay. Arts. So I would watch like uh, Jimmy Wang Yu, Blood of the Dragon, and, all, and uh, the um, Shaw Brothers films, things oh, like that throughout the okay. 70s. Um, and there were a lot of like the Bruce Lee films. So I watched a few of those, not knowing who, if it was Bruce Lee or not. Yeah. But the first film I watched in the theater was Enter the Dragon in the drive-in theater. Uh, what year was that? Do you remember? That was 1979 slash 80. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Because you're a little younger than I am, so uh, yeah. about, about 10 years. So I saw it in 73. So you probably saw it when it was re-released again, right? Yes, exactly. In the late 70s. Yes. Because they would always re-release Enter the Dragon. Always in the theater. Uh, yeah, everyone wanted to always capture that. So, so then you saw Into the Dragon, and then what was the next movie you saw after that of Bruce Lee? Game of Death. Ah, okay, Game of Death. Uh, I saw that in, uh, in the Woodhaven. Okay. And I saw that in the 80s, and I remember um, the scene, because you know, it doesn't have Bruce Lee in the whole movie. Right, right, away. Yeah, yeah. But that motorcycle scene with the guys fighting in the rain, Yeah. I remember watching that in the movie theater, and then when I left the theater, it was raining. Yeah. So I started walking down the street like, <sighs> <laughs> and I, was, I was mimicking the movements because yeah, yeah. I felt like the motorcycles were going to roll up on me. You know, you start I hear you, having I hear that Bruce Lee fantasy. Now, now where did you live growing up as a kid? I was on the Lower East Side in, in Manhattan. Where were you? Where did you grow up? I was born in the South Bronx. Okay. And uh, my mom, my, my dad was from Puerto Rico. Ah, my okay. dad was from the Lower East Side. Mm -hmm. And then my mom was from the Bronx at that time. Okay. But from in 1973, we moved to Springfield, Massachusetts. Oh, okay. So um, in my earlier years, I lived in Springfield. Oh, you did? Yes. Okay. And then when did you move back to... Uh, to New the York city, city. Uh, 1980. 1980. Yeah, to the Jersey City area, Jersey, New, uh, New Jersey. But I moved 47 times as a kid. Wow! So. Talk about moving around a we lot, were, man. We were gypsies. We were gypsies. Yeah. Now, why was that? Just because? You... Yeah, just the family. Just the finding family. better quality of life. That yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Wow! 47 times. Mm -hmm. Amazing, man. Now, when, when did you first decide to uh, take up? Uh, martial arts and was that inspired by Bruce Lee or was that an influence of your dad or someone else? Um, when it came to the martial arts, my biggest influence was Bruce Lee. Okay. Um, and most of the kids, I mean, that's all we talked about. Yeah. You know, in, in, in the neighborhood, all the kids were doing, you know, the movements, even yeah. though they didn't know martial arts. And I used to go to the school, like different dojos and mm -hmm. stand outside and look inside because by that time I didn't have the money, I didn't have the resources. Yeah. So I would just look in and like dream about being Bruce Lee, you know, wanted, wanted to do that stuff, but I didn't have the, the ability to do it. I got you, I got you. And then I got into it in 1978. Okay. It was, a, it was a free program where a van came into the neighborhood and they gave out flyers to all the kids to do, you know, the martial arts. Yeah. But we had to sign the permission slip. Oh, okay. So they took a whole bunch of neighborhood, you know, riffraff 
and they put us on this van and uh, they took us away and we went to the school and it was, it was scary. Wow. It was, tough. They were, it was like Into the Dragon with uh, the, the Black Karate Federation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so it, was, it was, that was, like, yeah, so was that kind of school. Yes, it was that kind of thing. I got you, I got you. Yeah. And what was the first style that you studied? Shotokan. It was Shotokan Karate? Yes. Ah, I got you. How long did you study that for? I did that for about, um, about a year. Okay. And then from there we, we were moving. Okay. So the constant moving and then, you know, it was totally so moving about. Every time you moved, did you then look for another martial arts school another to become Shoto, a... Yes, I did Shotokan throughout the years. Oh, you I did? Find, yes. But I also did, um, I joined a school called um, Kalai Griffin Iron Dragons in Springfield, Massachusetts. Okay. Kalai Griffin was a student of Ed Parker. Ah, okay. And that's a big connection because Bruce Lee, 1960, oh, yeah. Long Beach Internationals. Yeah, I mean, he, uh, he, uh, he knew Ed Parker, right? And he was a big influence on Bruce Lee's life back then and really kind of pushed his uh, yes. career along. He did all the, the international tournaments through Ed Parker. And, and the Green Hornet started from that too. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Wow. All right. So, uh, so then you did Shotokan for how many, how many years did you study Shotokan? Well, now I've been doing it uh, throughout the years because that's what I teach. That's yeah. the main system that I teach. Okay. So I've been doing Shotokan now for over 40 years. Wow, 40 years. And when did you become a black belt to what? An instructor. An yes, instructor. Shihan, yes. Okay, wow. And you've been teaching how long now? I started teaching um, when I was 13 years old. The first dojo I started teaching was in 1983. The oh, first wow. time I actually okay. officially teach, uh, started teaching on the floor. Yeah. Where they gave me the floor and I started doing what, they, what we call a senpai or, or sihin. Okay. Where you get the ability to teach. You don't have command of the whole yeah. dojo or class or the school. But you start doing smaller classes, and they right. start giving you that that benefit. Of got teaching. you, got you. Now, knowing uh, Bruce Lee's uh, martial art at the time was Wing Chun. I mean, uh, we were all kind of trying, you know, me included, was trying to discover the fighting arts that Bruce Lee studied mm -hmm. in that day, and it was hard to discover because no one knew what his fighting style was at that time. You saw it on screen, and I know I would ask people, "What is that style?" And no one knew what it was because he created his own you know, art, right? But we knew the foundation was Wing Chun, so I went out and looked for Wing Chun school because I wanted to see where his roots started from. Did you also study Wing Chun or any form of uh, boxing and to try yes. to assimilate what Bruce studied at that time? Well, as a kid, I remember hearing that Bruce did 26 styles. That was like, a, I don't know if it was a street rumor, but yeah, it was like yeah. 26 styles. That was, that was what was on the street. Yeah, he did these 26 styles and then the fencing and the Wing Chun. But um, I started doing Wing Chun in 1985. Okay. With a one of my friends, rest in peace, uh, Sifu Lenny. And okay. I started Wing Chun in Brooklyn, but I've always kn known about it. But my official study started in 1985. I started with the Sunum Tao form. And oh, you did? Doing sticky hands. Sticky with hands. Yeah, the Chi Sao. And how long did you stick with Wing Chun? I've been doing Wing Chun nonstop since then. Wow. Yeah, throughout the years. So and now it's been about about 30, 37, 38 years. Wow. And, and who did uh, your friend Lenny study from at that time? Because there were some um, key instructors that time. I yeah. studied from Duncan Leon, who came from Hong Kong, who you know, uh, studied on the Yip Man at the time. I'm talking about the early 70s. But there was a lot of good instructors that came yeah. over here. Lenny, Lenny trained and all those. Right. He trained um, under the, uh, like, Neil Khalifi at one point. Okay. He trained with, like, Neil Khalifi, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so yeah. different instructors, because everybody has a different Wing Chun approach. Yep. Um, I also train on the Ling Tung lineage uh, with oh, Alan Fong. Ling Ling Tung. Tung. Okay. So there's different, um, different, you know, little things, little little differences. Wow. But but, but it's basically self defense. I got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So did you? Uh, when did you start competing? Because I, I see I'm looking around the school and I see dozens and dozens of martial arts trophies. Uh, so how did that become part of your uh, your, um, your your influence? Yeah, I, I went to my first tournament in 1983. I was, I was uh, 13 years old, and um, I thought I was the big fish in the dojo at that time. Because, you, know, you know, I, I was into yeah. certain things, and there was a, three guys, and we were like the top guys. So yeah. we felt like really strong and really like, okay, we're good, right? Then our teachers took us to this tournament in Connecticut. It was the Ed Brown tournament. Yeah. First tournament I ever went to in my life. And I had seen tournaments in the magazines. Right. I would read about uh, Black Belt Magazine, yep. Inside Karate, uh, Karate Illustrated, all these different types of magazines. And you would see the ratings. And I would read about Chuck Norris mm -hmm. from the 60s, the Golden Era. I read about Super Four Wallace, yeah. Joe, Joe Lewis. All those the were all the key greats at the time, right, man. All those greats. Wow. So, uh, but when I went to the tournament, um, I was like, wow, because it was just amazing. These guys were good. Yeah. Were real good. I thought I, I knew something, but like, I got I to gotta go practice. Because I thought, you know, you had, yeah. you had the, we walk around with Chinese slippers, we had the fever, <laughs> but uh, we weren't as good as we thought. Yeah. These guys yeah. were amazing. They all had the Bruce Lee feeling too, because a lot of them started with the Bruce Lee. 
energy. And what kind of uh, tournament fighting was it at the time? Was it a point system? Was it uh, well, that that tournament style? Contact in the, or? in the eighties, there was more contact. It was because there was no headgears. Ah, okay. So the headgears that came, like when you see them, were head protectors. Yeah. That came later on because someone died in a match in Florida. Oh wow! There was a match where a gentleman got kicked with a spinning hook kick, and he hit his head on the floor and passed away. So they, because of insurance, yeah, the headgears. Wow. But back then. Usually the guys would wear just cloth padding on their, on their hands and just shin pads. That was in a groin cut. Yeah. Because they had groin kicks at certain points. Wow. Certain turns, they kick to the groin. Groin kicks were allowed. Yeah. And uh, even throws in some matches, they allowed it. Wow. So there was not a little rules and regulations back then when it first hit the scene. It seems don't get like. hit. Yeah, don't get hit. <laughs> that was it. And how, but, I, but I didn't start in ADP competing. I, that was my first tournament. Yeah. I started in 1985 competing. That was my first tournament. And yeah. how long did you compete for? I've been competing nonstop. Wow. Throughout the years. Um, when in the 80s, I competed uh, in and out of tournaments. I was young. I was yeah. a teenager. I was, uh, at that time, I was living in Brooklyn, New York, in uh, the middle capital of the United States, yep. New York. I was in a bad area. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I was always training, getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning because of Bruce Lee. Yeah. And also Rocky. I was a big Rocky fan. Oh, yeah. Who, who, who didn't love uh, Stallone and Rocky? That was very inspirational. And they both were the about training. I know, I all know. about training. And you look at Bruce Lee and Rocky, they were about, about hard training. Yeah, hard training. Wow, yeah, wow. So uh, so then how did you fare in the, in the tournaments? Did you did you so win a lot of the tournaments? I was or? 15 and I went into the men's division the first time I competed. One of my friends, uh, he didn't want to compete that day, so he gave me his ticket. And I said, give me the ticket, I'll fight. And I jumped in, I got disqualified for knocking the guy out. In the wow. Fist. Spinning back, it was a spinning back fist. Yeah. But it was illegal, you couldn't do that. You couldn't, you couldn't do spinning back fist. Yeah, yeah. Chuck Norris used to use it in competition. Yeah. But at that tournament, you couldn't do it, so I got disqualified. But I was only 15. Yeah, so, yeah. I got you. You were still learning the ropes back then. Yeah. I had to compete. But and... I was used to hard contact. Yeah. Because um, of the training that we were doing, the sparring in the yeah. dojos. Even when I did uh, praying matches, Kung Fu, I did that for a while. Yeah. No gears. It was everything, you know. And, and throughout this whole time, uh, did Bruce always kind of live in the back of your mind as, as your main influence always. and inspiration? He was always there. Always. Every time I ran or I was working out and I... Uh, you know, I was training, and I would compare the movies that I was watching, like let's say the Five Deadly Venom, yeah. Mr. Killer, all those great movies. But I, they were great; I loved them. But I said they still move slower than Bruce Lee. Yeah. When you, when I would watch like Chinese Connection, or I would watch anything with Bruce Lee. They were great, but they moved a lot slower than Bruce Lee. There was one uh, actor, David Chang, I think his name was, and he's a good actor, but his movies were like his techniques yeah. were so slow. I would watch him, and I was like, Ugh. I, I think it was Five Masters of Death. Yeah. And then I watched Bruce Lee, I was like, there's no comparison. What do you think made Bruce Lee's movies stand out so much and, and him explode off the screen the way he did? Because he, you know, he was the one that kind of influenced and inspired everyone. I mean, uh, there was something unique and different. What, 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 for you, what was that? What was Explosiveness. His explosiveness. And the fighting spirit. Yeah. That, that raw energy. Yeah. The other guys were great, but there was more choreography. Yeah. Even though Bruce Lee had choreography, but it was that raw yeah. explosiveness. Yeah. That, that, that you need to, that's what, that's what everybody trains for. Yeah, well. So if you're, you're working to become a black belt or whatever, you have to have, it's like a box, you gotta have that yeah. pop in your punch. Bruce yeah. Lee had that. Yeah, he did, he did. He had a lot of screen presence, charisma, and uh, you know, he, at the time, he really wanted to bring that realism to fighting, right? Which, uh, before that, it was kind of a hokey, it was all stage, you know, it was swinging in the arms, and, and then he came about and you actually thought, I know when I was a kid and other kids, they actually thought when they saw the fights that it was a real fight he was having. Exactly. I remember when I introduced it to my kids, my kids were like, is he really fighting that? And I go, no, that's a movie, but it looks so real mm. that you would think he was in a real fight and that's what made the appeal exactly. so great. And his charisma and fighting ability look so swift, cat-like up there. Yeah. Man. Even now I show it to some of the younger kids in the school, in yeah. Joe. And they're mesmerized. They mesmerized. Like, when they show those scenes of him fighting, when he's talking, they're like, they don't pay attention. Yeah. Because, you know, they don't get it. Yeah. You know, the philosophy and all that. But when they see the fighting and the movements, they're like, yeah. They're, yeah. yeah. It's so special, true. It's, a it's special so true. Energy. Okay, so uh, let's get into the book that you wrote. I know you told me uh, a couple years back you wrote a book, right? Uh, and now, what inspired you to write this book? What was the name of the book? And, and, and tell us a little bit about this, because this was a huge project for you. Yes, um, this book is called The Kids of New York. Family, Street, Culture, and Violence. It's a book that took me uh, five years to write, but it was a lifetime of memories that I put into the book. Wow. So tell us a little bit, what's the theme of the book? So it's called The Kids of New York, because obviously you, were, you, you grew up in New York. Yes. And, and so what's the whole concept behind the book? I was born in the South Bronx, and then um, I moved around quite a bit. So um, because I was moving around quite a bit, 
uh, it was a little bit unstable for me, my home, you know, my home life. Yeah. So a lot of the things that I was experiencing back then are things that helped me to uh, to to strengthen myself. Got you. And the main thing was the martial arts. Wow. Yeah. And you write about that in the book? Yes, Qu quite a bit. Uh, there's a lot of uh, Bruce Lee stories in here. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of um, like Bruce Lee anecdotes. Yeah. A, a lot of uh, stories that are not only about the movies and the things that he did in the movies and film, but also about how we felt about it. Yeah. How the kids in the community reacted to his films and the things that we were doing on the streets yeah. and, and, and you know and yeah. everyday yeah. life. So that's what I talk about a lot. It's nice. not only about the movies themselves and about his training and the things that he, um, you know, that he developed. Yeah. But how did we react to it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, what was the uh, but there are a lot of different stories in here, yeah. Yeah, well, that's great. That's great. I know I read a little passage you had me read uh, earlier, and uh, you also touch upon a lot of the, uh, the things we grew up as kids in the 70s, which I can relate to, which I think a lot of people would be able to relate to the book. You talk about all the TV shows and the cartoon shows that we all yes. watched. That like shaped who we are, and the nostalgia behind it, which is kind of fun hearing. What were some of those 70s shows that really stood out for you? Um, for me, uh, in the 70s, uh, you had The Six Million Dollar Man, The Incredible Hulk. You had Beretta, Starsky and Hutch, Beast of San Francisco, wow, all the cop show SWAT. <laughs> you had the, the rookies. Yeah. I mean, Star Trek from the 60s, because a lot of the 60s show rolled into the, into the 70s. Yeah. Also, the Honeymooners. Yeah. Yeah. Ralph Cramden. So there was, there were, the, the, the great thing about those shows is that they had um, great acting. Yeah. And they had a sense of purpose, and there was always like a, like a, a, a reason. Yeah. For their stories, like if I watched, let's say, like the Super Friends cartoon, yeah. at the end they would have some type of morality. Yeah. They would talk about, okay, this is why you shouldn't do this. That was the good thing about television back then, as yeah. opposed to being just a fluff. Yeah, like yeah. it is now with all the reality TV shows. Yeah, it's yeah. too much fun. I preferred the uh, the shows of uh, the 70s as well. And did you remember all the uh, the sitcoms that Bruce Lee was in at the time? Yeah, um, of course, Green Hornet being yeah. the first one. I watched uh, Marlo. Yeah. And I watched Longstreet. Yeah. You know, later on, later not, on. not early on. The mm -hmm. first thing was the Green Hornet, but then later yeah. on, I watched that. Also, Bam, him beating up Robin. That was a great. That was a great. The crossover episode. Yeah. yeah. And, and I knew yeah. Robin had no chance, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> they, they try to give him a little slack. In the, in the, in the. And then he did a small appearance on Here Comes the Bride yes. and Ironside, where he played the karate instructor, where yes. Gene LaBelle was in there with him. Those Judo were all, Gene LaBelle. Yeah. Yeah, man. Those were all great, uh, great shows at that time. So uh, how do you how do you sell the book now? Is it on Amazon? If people wanted to pick up this book, can you purchase it on Amazon? Like, where do you find it? It's on Amazon.com. It's also on BarnesandNoble.com. There's a, a hard copy of the book. Oh, there or, is. Or, or um, I'm sorry, a soft copy like this. Okay. And then you can also get the ebook. Ah, it's on okay. Amazon.com, and you can put uh, "Kids of New York" by Anthony Colon. Okay, and so that's how people up. could pick this up. Yes. Yeah, I'm going to pick one up because uh, just reading a few paragraphs from there, it really brings you back to the 70s and 80s and how you grew up in a kid and yes. the culture back then. And, and it all runs through the thread of Bruce Lee in there. So uh, you I also did, uh, talk about 42nd Street, too. Chinatown, ah, we used to go to the movie theaters. Yeah. In the 80s, you would watch three movies for like $2.99. Those CD movie theaters. Everyone remembers those, man. Yes, it was, they were great. And you could bring food in there. You could do whatever, basically. And they yeah. would have the, the TV... Uh, the, the TV uh, screen on the outside, yep. it will show Seven Grand Masters, Mysteries of Chess Boxing, all of those wonderful movies because Bruce Lee set it off. Yes. See, so we, we wanted more. Yeah. So in that time, it was like Bruce Lee set it off for everybody. Yeah. And then after that, it was like, we want more. We yeah. Want more. Then when he passed away, you know, we, we kept going. Yep, yep. And then in the 80s, of course, you had the Karate Kid, Shokusugi with the ninja films. Chuck mm -hmm. Norris kept it alive. Chuck yeah. kept it alive. Yes. But it was Bruce Lee that set it off. Yeah, it really was. He started it off, as uh, as Linda Lee always says on our talk, uh, when she's interviewed, that you know Bruce Lee was the one that started it all, right? And he certainly did. Everything. And to this day, even after 50 years, that people are still feeling his, his influence and they're still being inspired by Bruce Lee. Yes. Uh, so his legacy continues. So uh, from the book then, when did you open up this school? Tell us a little bit about the school and how this came about. How long is it here now? Okay, well, this location has been here for about two years. Okay. But overall, I opened up my first school in 1990. I was 19 years old. Oh, wow. And I was influenced by several instructors that had schools back in the 80s, some of yeah. my teachers. Um, one of my instructors, Tommy Chen, 
I taught for him for three years. I was working with him, teaching and helping him. Yeah. So it was from him that I really get, got the blueprint of how to open a school. Ah, okay. So that's when I started opening up schools. This is actually my eighth school in New York City. Oh, wow. My eighth dojo location. Well, it's good to have a mentor uh, to show you how to do it because there's a lot of business side behind it that people yes. don't realize. You just don't open the school and hope that it succeeds, right? Yeah, it's a lot it's, of work. Yeah. yeah, it really is. So I uh, give you a lot of credit for that. And then who do you mainly teach? you teach adults, kids? Like, what do you? I teach all ages. From you do? zero to 99. Whoever has honest energy yeah. and wants to learn, from zero to 99, I'll teach them. So I'm you open. teach, you're open to everyone. If they're honest, yeah. yes. If someone wants to come in and just learn how to beat people up or has the bad energy, I won't work with them. Yeah, so I, you kind of pick up on that. You read that person when you first meet them. You do a little uh, yes, kind of yes. interview with them before you bring them yes, to school. Yes, I'll speak to them, yes. Yeah. Usually with children, you don't have those issues because the parents bring them in for discipline or for learning yeah. or for, you know, for weight loss, you know, these kind of things, exercise. But when you have adults coming in, you have to screen them a little bit more. You have to be more careful. Yeah, yeah. Adults. But I wow. teach everybody. So you've been teaching over 30 years now. Uh, right now is my 40th year. 40th year? Wow, you look so young, man. Yeah, I'm going to be 54 now. God bless you, man. You look, you you. look very young. Thank you, Charles. So, wow, 40 years now you've been teaching. That's, that's simply incredible. So when you, you do, like you do adults, but then do you have special kids classes? And what kind of lessons do you instill for the kids? With the younger kids, the main thing is structure. And how, when you say younger, what's the age group that you, you... The youngest we have is four. Oh, wow. You go as low as four. Yes. Four. Uh, the thing about the young kids is that it's an introduction into martial arts. Okay. So they get the structure. It's about discipline, you know, learning how to line up, yep. learning how to work together. So it helps their schoolwork. It helps them in home life, how to clean their room, how to pick up after themselves. Yeah. So it gives them that, that type of discipline. But I also have kids with autism. I have a lot of kids that have disabilities. So I work... I have to work in a different way yeah. too. I have to have a different approach. It can't be like the way it was like I hear years you. ago. Yeah, things have changed. You. Wow. So, so I heard you're also uh, really involved in the community, uh, you know, through your school. So what do you, what do you do outside of your school? How are you involved with the community? Right. So I do um, a program called Kids of New York. It's an event that we have citywide. We do it them in the Bronx, in the different boroughs, Brooklyn, Manhattan. And we have the kids come in, they do break dancing, they do electric boogie. <laughs> so uh, the hip hop, when we look at hip hop, break dancing, real hip hop, yeah, yeah. for the community, uh, a lot of that was influenced by Bruce Lee in martial arts. Yeah. There's a lot of, if you look at the swipes, the certain movements, people spinning in the head, Jackie Chan, Duncan yeah. Master, yeah. 70, 1976. So there's a lot of influence that comes from the martial arts into the world of hip hop, yeah. the roots of it. There are routines that some of the breakers were doing back then that were picked up right out of the Kung Fu movies. Yeah. The Shaw Brothers, Five Deadly Venoms, and all of that. Yeah, and everyone wanted to express themselves at that point through break dancing, right? So when yes. Bruce says, honestly, express yourself, I know when you listen to these skateboarders and break dancers, they all talk about them honestly expressing themselves through that discipline that they're picking up, right? And that was all Bruce Lee's influence. And Bruce Lee has style. His yeah, clothing, he does. He had extreme style. If you look at his clothes, the way he dressed, mm -hmm. so he wasn't just a guy with a kung fu, a raggedy kung fu suit. He yeah, had style. He really did. If you look at Into the Dragon, the game of death, he was transcending certain things, and he was just, he would iron his clothes. He would, you know, he was very meticulous. Yeah. So if you grew up a certain way, let's say in poverty, you grew up in the tough kind of environments, he was an example. He was physically fit. Yeah, yeah. He was intelligent. He was articulate with his writing. Mm -hmm. You look at his books, the way and he his wrote. penmanship, beautiful, oh, beautiful yeah, penmanship. Yeah, he took pride yeah. in everything he did. Right. He was a genius. And he was, he a, really he was, was a genius across the board. Across the board. It wasn't just one thing. He was yeah. also a musician. He played in Return of the Dragon. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So for and he was also open-minded. He wasn't, uh, you know, he taught blacks, uh, whites, Latinos. He taught mm -hmm. everybody. Everyone. So he was. That's like, why his appeal was so great. Oh, yeah. yeah, exactly. And all of us, we were like, wow. This guy's amazing. So instead of like, you know, us watching, you know, things on TV like cartoons where you had these superhero characters, we were watching a guy who was a real human being, but yeah. could, do, could do the moves. Yeah. And, and the kicking, you know, the high head kicks and the spinning kicks. I remember they used to say, oh, you're a sissy, you throw kicks. Yeah. But sissies punch, they don't kick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was a big thing too. Yeah, and it's funny you bring that up because, you know, in the old days, you know, our, our superheroes were all the cartoon characters, right? Spider-Man, Batman, the Hulk, right? And then Bruce Lee came around and all of a sudden we had this real life hero now mm -hmm. who became everyone's hero to this day. But he was a real person, right? Exactly. That we were now looking up to. Huge, huge... Uh, you know, crust of what he, how he inspired all of oh, us yeah. because he it's was amazing. a real person, not just a fictional superhero. No. And even all the greats, you look at Sugar Ray Leonard and a lot of, like, he's my favorite boxer. Yeah. He's Muhammad Ali and uh, Sugar Ray always gives compliments. I know, they do. To, to Bruce yeah. Lee. And these are the, the top I fighters know. in the world, legends themselves. Hector Camacho! Woo! Hector yeah, Camacho Hector, another, another one. Rest in peace, yeah. Hector yeah. Camacho. 
Because he did Wing Chun. He used that in the ring, too. He would do the you Wing Chun. You could see it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You, you could see it. And all that stuff. Yeah. And, uh, even Conor McGregor now, they, they, they all say that it was because of Bruce Lee that yes. they do what they do and how they were inspired by him yes. to bring their art to where they are today. They, yeah, and to the dragon scene, that, that beginning scene with, with, uh, with Samo Hung. Yeah. That, that's... That's MMA right there. It is. You look at it because the 50 gloves. 50 years back. Even, even the gloves, yeah. Yeah. The, with the little tightsies on. Yeah. I mean, to put yourself, yourself out there wearing those little tightsies. Yeah. Oh. Because if you think about it, it's all Kung Fu pants, long, exactly. wearing tightsies yeah. out there. Doing no all that one stuff. saw that before. Nobody saw that. I know. And, and here it comes with the finger gloves, the little and he briefs. Added, he added that last minute. Yes. It was a last minute addition. But he said, I must add this. But it's amazing that he was doing that back in 1973. Back then. Yeah. And it's just. It's yeah, the guy was a genius. The, the, the ideas the he came up with. Yeah. The Gracie's give him a lot of respect. You know, and he trained a lot of the greats Chuck Norris, Mike Stone, Joe Lewis, so many. And, you know, some people don't admit things. Yeah. But he trained, because look at the angles and, and the blitzes and all the stuff that people were doing. Yeah. That's Bruce Lee's explosive attack off the line. Because there's something called a blitz in karate tournaments. Yeah. Where the guys, they close the gap very quickly mm -hmm. to get to the gap, to the target. That's all Bruce Lee. Yeah. You, as you, he would close the gap from a distance. Oh, yeah. You see the footwork he does in the beginning of that fight with Sammo Hung. They show you his feet and how quickly he closes the gap and moves exactly. back, right? Yeah. Exactly. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. So, uh, yeah. So, we talked about some of your community involvement, your, your book. Uh, why don't we finish off with the school, and then I want to talk about you and how you got into some of your collectibles, and you have quite a bit of books here and uh, collectibles from Green Hornet and stuff like that. So, uh, so f as far as the school goes, so where can they find you in the school? Uh, you know, where is the school located? And money, give the address to the people out there, and how can they reach you? Okay, they can reach me at my phone. They can call me at three four seven six two three one three nine one. 623 You can text me or call me. And uh, they can come in if they call me, you know, we can set something up and they can come by and I'll give them more information. Got you. And what's the address of the school? Uh, well, we don't do like walk-ins. I'd rather oh, call me oh, first. Oh, okay. Yes. But it's yes. in Hel Elmer's Queens, it's right? Elmer's Queens, okay. yes, correct. Got you, got you. Yeah, so look up by Anthony Colon, man. He's uh, the real deal, community involvement, influenced by Bruce Lee, really helps out the kids and uh, uh, teaches a lot of morals and values as part of his teaching as well. So right. a great guy, man. And uh, I noticed I, I picked up this book. Uh, because, you know, this is one of the first books that I purchased. So not one of the first, but early books that I purchased. This series was great when it came out. The Power of Bruce Lee and mm -hmm. Who Killed Bruce Lee and, you know, The Secrets of Bruce Lee. Remember that whole series that came mm -hmm. out on this? I have them. I actually have them, but they're dug deep, deep in my closet. So okay, I got, I got you. Them out. <laughs> yeah, so you, uh, you not only were inspired, but you also did a little collecting on Bruce Lee as well. Yes. Uh, well, throughout the 70s, you had a lot of mom and pop stores. Yeah. Kung Fu stores. You have, had them in Chinatown. You had the Bookley Tide, I think it was. Yeah, Bookley Tide. Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris. You had um, the Honda store, Honda Martial Arts. Oh, I remember that on, in the 40s, right? right yeah, right. yeah. So you had Honda. You had um, uh, a store in Brooklyn. I'm sorry, in, in, uh, yes, in Brooklyn. It was on Jamaica Avenue by something. There was a little store there that I used to go to. You had Tiger Kim's in the Bronx. So yes. On Road. He had a big store right on the Grand Concourse. And there were a lot of stores. Yeah, though. yeah. So also uh, 42nd Street you had the Crown Store right by the movie theaters, the Kung Fu movie theaters, right in the middle of the block. They used to sell everything, weapons, posters, and everybody was in those places. Yeah. So you would have, you know, and you would meet up with all the martial artists. People would start asking each other questions. Yes. Oh, what style you practice? Or, you know, where are you from? You know, these kind of. Man, things. those are great days. There's nothing like that now, mm -hmm. man. Back then, there was so so much camaraderie, the internet, community, the and yeah, now there's everything on the internet. But yeah. back then, it was all in person. You met these guys, and you finally met up with someone. You go, ah, oh, they're just like me. They love Bruce Lee. They're into the martial arts, and yes. all of a sudden, you have this common thread. The difference back then too is that you physically had to get up and go somewhere. Yeah. You you know, like when we watch something on TV or even a movie. You couldn't download things. Yep. Was, now it's yep. easy. You just push a button. Back then, if we wanted to, we had to look in the newspaper. Yep. You look in the newspaper and you have to look at where the movies were playing, with the karate yep. movies, kung fu movies, whatever we wanted to watch. Then you got to get on the train or yep. you got to go down the block or walk five, six blocks. When we wanted a book, we had to go get it. It yep. wasn't like, you know, you got to have it delivered to you. It wasn't like that. Later on, then you had the, the mail order type stuff, but yeah. it was... It was Go get it. If wow. you want it, go get it. Yeah. And there was thousands doing that. So it looks like you collected a lot of books uh, in, in your time. You have the Bruce Lee fighting method. Oh, yeah. Let, let the, me move uh, back so you can see better. The Art of Expressing the Human Body. This was a great series. Oh, yeah. Uh, the ones that John Little put out. Right? Yes. Uh, and then you have, uh, I love this book. That one was great, Wrath of the Dragon. Oh, man. Did you read this one? This is the newest one put out by uh, John Little. Yeah, it's awesome. Right? What do, you, what do you think of this? The Real Fights of Bruce Lee. What I liked about Wrath of the Dragon is that he kept it very honest. He kept the book very honest. Um, he talks about Bruce Lee's early days, and there's a few stories in there that 
um, I read earlier on, but he really touched it up. Mm -hmm. And then there were a lot of things that I didn't know about. Which yeah. Was, re re like revelations in there, which was pretty cool. Yeah, I, I think this was much needed because there's so many naysayers out there to this day that still say Bruce Lee was not a real fighter, which is kind of amazing that people still say that and that he was just Naive. a movie star. Yeah. Uh, you know, based on this book and all the fights he actually had that no one knew about that John Little got from all the people that were around Bruce at that and time. And all the challenges. And all challenges. the challenges that we never even knew about that's all documented in this book firsthand. Yes. Yes. And he won all the challenge matches. Yeah. This is fascinating. I'm, I'm, I'm almost done with it. I'm, I can't even put it down. It's so good. So give John Little a lot of credit for putting this out and, uh, you know, the real fights of Bruce Lee. If you haven't picked this up, definitely pick it up through uh, Amazon. And uh, I'll leave a link in the video if you want to find this book because it's a must read. I love this book. Yeah, so here's another cool uh, collectible that's in uh, Anthony Colon's collection. So what are these? These are uh, the action figures? Yes, yeah, from Kate on the Green Hornet. Yeah, so I got these. I got these a few years ago. I just don't remember where. But um. yeah, these these kind of came came out a couple of years back. But they're they're fun. Then you have uh, Van Williams there as the Green Hornet, and you have Bruce here with the Chucks, the darts, the stars, everything he used. Yeah. Uh, in in the Green Hornet television series, right? And the beautiful thing is that when you look at uh, what Bruce Lee was doing with hand to hand combat. He was also innovative in releasing a lot of the weapons for the first time yes. in the film, like the Nunchaku. When you look at the Nunchaku, he was the first one to really put it on film. Yeah. And he, everybody was going crazy because I used to make chucks when I was a kid. Everybody was making homemade chucks. Yeah, yeah, remember that? Yeah. With would, the broomsticks? Exactly, with the broomsticks and you would, you know, your parents were like, what are you doing? Yeah. And we were making chucks running around the neighborhood. And when you think of it, he really, people always say, oh, he introduced chucks in Chinese Connection. That's the first time he pulled it out in the, in the movies. But he really introduced the chucks in Green Hornet. Yes, correct. Right? Because yes. you forget that he used them in the Green Hornet back in 66. Yes. Which no one even knew what that was at the time. Exactly, and the darts. Because we look at the ninja movies with the stars and shuriken and all that stuff. Yeah. But Bruce was already throwing darts. Exactly. And stuff. So he was like the first ninja too. Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny, man. He did it all, that guy. And the three sectional too. Yep. The three, the six three section staff, right? Because everybody thinks about Master Killer, 36 Chamber, where Gordon Liu, yeah. which is a beautiful movie. But Bruce Lee was the first one because he did it in the Mantis episode where he's fighting. Uh, who was the, uh, the the guy in the uh, Green Hornet, the Mantis Master? Oh, yeah, yeah, well, Danny Ma and Mako. 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 Yeah, but uh, Danny and Santo actually played that part. You thought it was Mako, but he pulled in Danny and Santo to actually play yes. Mako's role, because, you know, he was... That's the best role. I think it's the best episode. Oh, oh, yeah, and that was the best fight in, in all the Green Hornet it's, it's, uh, series. It's up to date. It's a beautiful fight scene. It really is. The culture, too. Oh, man. Very really culture. Really beautiful. And well, the noon chocolate was in The Hunter and The Hunted. Yes. Yes. Thank you for that. Hector Martinez! <laughs> well, listen man, this was great. I know I know we're gonna probably end with a little uh, Noonchuck demonstration. I wanna meet a few of your students. Yes. So I wanted to thank you again oh, for your time you here so today, much, man, and inviting us to your so school. Much. And I wanna thank Hector for uh, introducing you, Hector. us, because uh, I know he's been friends with you for a while now, and uh, I finally got a chance to interview you, meet you. I know we've been trying to set this up for a while, so uh, thanks for your time here today, thank man. Thank you so much, Charles. Appreciate, yeah, it. appreciate it. Uh, guys, I hope you enjoyed the show, and again, uh, Charles Damiano signing out from the Bruce collection saying have fun collecting but before we end we are going to show a little demonstrations of some noon chucks we're going to meet some of uh anthony cologne students here so stay tuned Line up. Yeah. Wow. Oof. 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 i have three of my students that are going to present some of their skills we have jimer we have johanna and we have anthony take a bow Oof. Jima will demonstrate a card first. So, senpais, come here. Get over here. Jima, move to the center. Oops. Oops. Hi! The two ladies here um, are two of the best students in the school. They're very dedicated. Angela Ma, of course, and Into the Dragon opened up everybody's eyes that females are very strong, very powerful, and they don't take a backseat to anybody else because they have those skills, yes? So now I have my student, Johanna. She's going to demonstrate Nunchaku, reminiscent of the late Bruce Lee.
Oh, you just spinning kick as well, do three, three spinning hook kicks. In the back. You gotta have the leg, right, side kick. Right, whoosh, very good. Whoosh! Very good. Now we have Anthony. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. And then you'll be a card. Don't get hurt at each. Don't get hurt at each. Um, are very uh, special to me. My mom gave me my first pair of real chucks in 1983, December of 1983. They were in a little shop that I used to walk by that was in Bridgeport, Connecticut. I was living in Bridgeport, Connecticut at that time. And I would see them there and they were just hovering in, in the glass shelves. And they, would have, they had ninja stars, all these type of things. And I was like, man, I want those chucks. And before these, I had the chucks that you would make at home. You know, the homemade ones with the little hooks and you would spin them in there and the the mops, the brooms, and you would cut them with a saw or whatever. And I had those, but they didn't have that swivel. They didn't have the, the ball bearings. And you needed this. So they didn't, they didn't have that, that, you know, that, that whole thing. So these are beautiful because of my first pair. They were black, just like Enter the Dragon. But what I really loved is that they had the studs on them. So it gives them that nice little uh, style, especially in the 80s with the uh, <laughs> break dancing. Hey. So I'm going to do a few moves, just the basics. so much. That was fantastic. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Hector. You're very welcome. This is our, our entertainment area where we show uh, videos, Bruce Lee movies, we show uh, all types of martial arts. And then over here we have um, some weapons, weapons rack for training. We have uh, the trophy area from tournaments, uh, competitions and things like that. And then over here we have a training area. We have the chin-up bar, which is absolutely necessary. Um, my, my first Influence with chin-ups was Bruce Lee the the four books the, the red the green the yellow those four little books that he had So I was always looking at that he would have a trampoline in the book and he would do the stretches He would do the jump straddle he would do the flying sidekick and uh, I would read about him running four or five miles a day at 20 24 minutes So that was a huge thing. So that's where I really got the root of all my uh, training in the beginning and then of course the weights the free weights also the abdominal exercises because Bruce Lee had a, a great set of abs and a push-up bars of course my little kung fu birds over here can't forget the kung fu birds these are actually the real teachers in the dojo here because they inspire everybody to move faster and then over here we have uh some pictures on the wall we come this way we have uh, a lion head up there we, we used to have traditional lion dancing some of the uh equipment Kicking pads, very important because Bruce Lee was actually one of the first people, if not the first person, to kick a football shield. When his students brought him a pad, he started blasting the pads and training with pads and focus mitts and all these types of things before anyone else was really doing it. And that, that prototype, I think the original shield now, it's uh, 38,000 or something like that in the auction, Hector. It's 38,000, which is amazing. They have like little handles on them with little screws, but a beautiful thing to, I wish I had that, but uh, can't afford it. But anyways, you have some weapons here. You have uh, all types of different weapons. You have a hand gripper here, which of course Bruce Lee used all types of different uh, apparatus for training. But of course that, that 
Tiger Claw gripper, which I'm gonna have my students try to mess with this. Here, Johanna, give it a shot. Try to squeeze that. <laughs> which, you gotta put your fingers in there, yeah? Have fun with that. You gotta put the other one in the bottom with your thumb, and then you try to squeeze it. She's doing it for the first time, Ooh, but not bad. Wow. Pretty good grip. Okay, so that develops your punch, your grabbing, your grappling moves, and all of these type of things. Over here I have my, my little office, I have some statues up here. I have some pictures of old masters and different types of things, awards and things of that nature. I have a picture signed by Grandmaster Jun Ri, who was actually one of the gentlemen who inspired Bruce Lee to throw kicks. The higher kicks, Bruce Lee was more uh, low range with the kicks, with the Wing Chun. Then later on he started adding more of the high kicking techniques. And also uh, Jigoro Okano, which is the grappling, which Bruce Lee was highly influenced by Hayward Nishioka, Gene LaBelle. Um, Wally J and people like that, they were good friends of Bruce Lee, so he incorporated that, incorporated that into the martial arts as well. And then we have more pictures here. We've got punching bag, heavy bags. We have a nice array of uh, a collection of chucks here. And then we have some, some of the books and things like that on the side. I have a lot more books in the closet, but um, that would be a whole day to get them out. And then we have pictures up here with old martial artists throughout the years. All different types of teachers and martial artists. This is actually me when I was 19. I was a youngster there. That picture was taken in 1990. That was in the winter, um, and it was about 10 degrees out that day, but we would train barefoot outside. And then, of course, you have Lee Shaolong and Bruce Lee again with some of his nice vintage Shaw Brothers uh, pictures, which unfortunately he never got to, to film because of his passing. And then we come on this side. We have... Hu Yanja, which everybody knows, Hector, The Chinese Connection. I think that's your favorite movie too, from all of them. And of course, different masters of martial arts. And then we come on this side. And again, we run into Li Xiaolong, Bruce Lee, which everybody was hoping that he would make a movie with Shaw Brothers. Unfortunately, that never came to pass, but he at least did several pictures, which was, uh, they were beautiful shots. And if he did a film, he could have been one of the Venoms. That would have been awesome to see him as a Venom. And it would have been a great thing. And then you have, of course, the Venoms themselves. If you look up here, you have Lo Meng and Lu Feng, who played the centipede number one, and he also played the, uh, the toad number five. And they were in a lot of different movies. All of the Kung Fu movies and all the martial arts movies actually elevated because of Bruce Lee. Before that, people were flying for like two hours, or they would go flying on the beach and throw a flying sidekick. It took them 10 minutes to get to the other side of the beach while they're still in the air. But uh, Bruce Lee really uh, made the movies realistic and gave it a sense of urgency with the fighting. And the Shaw Brothers, they also capitalized on that. If you look at uh, Lao Kar Long and you look at um, Chang Che, the way they started making the movies later on, beautiful. They were beautiful, but that was all Bruce Lee's inspiration. There, a lot of those guys knew Bruce Lee as well. And then over here, of course, we're going to end it with this last picture here, which, of course, is the final film of Bruce Lee that he got to film in... Uh, in 1973, Enter the Dragon. Unfortunately, Bruce Lee passed July 20, 1973. And um, of course, uh, he didn't get to see the film. He saw you know, the editing as far as the, the film itself, but never heard the music that uh, Lalo Schifrin did, which was the, uh, the beautiful soundtrack for Enter the Dragon, which he also did Mission Impossible and a few other TV shows and movies. But uh, lastly, I just want to say that without uh, Bruce Lee's inspiration, me personally, I wouldn't be here teaching martial arts and I wouldn't have done a lot of the things that I've done throughout the martial arts if it wasn't for Bruce Lee and he's inspired millions of people. A lot of people became better because of Bruce Lee. They, a lot of kids that were involved in negative things, they became positive in whole life because of the inspiration of a real person, of a human being. Superb. Super.